Hello, good morning. It's another beautiful Saturday morning, and you're welcome to another edition of ACP Life. Today, we're going to be having our open house discussion. In other words, you get to ask all sorts of questions as relating to children. My name is Bisola Gumbadewa, and with me in the studio this morning is Dr. Bimisola Boyedi. Please stay tuned, share with your friends, invite them over, and let's have fun this morning. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to be here this morning and uh, happy voting day. I hope all of us have uh, registered to be part of the election this morning. So um, we wish you the best and we wish Nigeria all the very best today as we decide our leaders. So, but here we have just our ATP live and just another one hour for us to ask our child health related questions and answers you know we had different topics over the months and usually we decide that the last saturday of the month will be an opportunity for us to you know ask questions any questions so that we can address them and some of them you ask questions that are not related to the topic we're treating and so and we were not able to address them but today is you're free to ask anything whatsoever you ask you want to ask so feel free to share our video feel free to put your questions and comments and we'll be here myself and Bisola to address them so thank you so much for joining us this morning and let's start having the question coming in and if you are watching from our uh, watch party uh we we may not be able to see your questions so you may need to navigate to the video or uh, we trust some of our uh volunteers to help us draw your questions down here so good morning to everyone who's saying good morning to us so welcome to ATP live please share the video put your questions and comments we're so excited to be with you this morning thank you 
Tak kisah. Susah lah. Why we are waiting for our questions? So I don't know. I mean, is there anything you think we can talk about? Is there anything you think we would like us to um, deal with this morning? <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure that was all with me. Okay, so we just continue and then we can take your question. I can see Vera. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're all welcome. Yeah, okay. I think sometimes my moderator's internet sometimes acts up, so I'm sure Busala will join me again very soon. So uh once again, it is ATP open house um open house so you are free to ask your questions you are free to um to ask us any question and let's let's start um let's start some time so that we can begin to address your question we want a situation where we'll start uh we'll now start running to finish your questions at the end of the day so this is the best time to ask your questions and we'll be able to address them all right so while we're still waiting for the questions i'm going to start putting up some of the videos of uh we've been introducing something new on ATP now and that is giving you some condensed information uh so i'll be sharing some of them with you this morning just for us to have an understanding of what we've been talking about I'm still waiting for your question, but please be ready. Okay, so we're waiting for our questions, but we'll start, I'll just be sharing some of our ATP information with you as we are going on. Okay, I think we are all back to the house. Yeah, so welcome back, Busala. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I think we still have our questions already. I'll just um, show them and then we can take them. Ibasala, can you read it for us? Okay, so Omolara Pardon is asking, can cerebral palsy be cured as in children living a normal life again? So I guess this is a, a question that arose from our last week uh, ATP life where we had the uh, the discussion about developmental delays and and things like that so uh i guess that's where this particular question is coming from so um yes we for those who don't know what cerebral palsy is i think i'm focused start with that to say that um, cerebral palsy is a develop it's a it's a condition in which due to an injury to the brain of a child when the baby is still developing, it could be in the womb, it could be during birth, it could be shortly after birth. But in that period when the brain of the baby is, is still developing, when there's an injury to that brain, uh, and it leads to the child having some difficulties with their, uh, uh, what we call motor function, the ability to move and things like that, some other issues could be associated with it as well. That's what we call cerebral palsy. Now, when it comes to cerebral palsy, the injury that has happened to the brain is a permanent injury. In other words, there's really nothing you can do to that injury that has happened to the brain itself. But the, the good thing about it is that the injury doesn't progress. In other words, it's a, what we call a static injury. In other words, the, the injury to the brain doesn't get worse. And it's just the same. At, at the end of the day, the manifestation of the uh, the cerebral palsy depends on the severity of that injury. 
So for some children, it is so severe that um, uh, they, we have different classification of cerebral palsy. So we have what we call uh, level one uh, GM FCS, that is level one function to level five. What that means is when you see somebody with level one function, that person, you will hardly know the person has cerebral palsy. The person can do virtually almost everything that other persons are doing. But when you see somebody with level five, that person is in wheelchair and, and may not be able to do things for themselves. And that tends to remain the same. In other words, so cerebral palsy cannot be cured. It's a permanent injury to the brain. Uh, we can't do anything to what has happened to the brain, but we can help those who have the condition to live as normal life as possible by supporting them. And depending on the level or the severity of the um, of the injury, so of, of the cerebral palsy level of function. So you have people with cerebral palsy who are lawyers, who are doctors, who are pediatric neurologists, and you also have people with cerebral palsy who will always be in the wheelchair. Who we never works. That's the you know, so that's the extreme of uh, cerebral palsy. So it depends on the severity of the injury to the brain and the level of function of the uh, person who has the cerebral palsy. So I, I hope I've answered that, Zomolara. So I move on. Mm, excuse my moderator. I think um, I guess there will be a lot of internet challenge today because everybody's at home in Nigeria today. <laughs> All right, so Jacob Lobby is asking a baby of 14 months that is still not working, what can be done? Okay, again, it's like this is like a continuation of last week's uh, ATP life. So, usually, I at that ATP life, I talk about the fact that we have what we call the average range of achieving developmental milestones. So, the every child will, will should work between averagely one year, some may work in slightly earlier than one year, some may work slightly later than one year. But we pediatricians have what we call a limiting age. In other words, as what age will I worry as a pediatrician? What is now beyond what is no more range? So for us, we start worrying about 18 months. So if a 14 month old is not yet working, I will not worry. I will just say, leave the baby alone, especially if the baby is able to do other things that precede working. In other words, the baby is sitting, the baby is crawling, the baby is even standing, maybe cruising around the table. We'll hold the table and walk around it. If the baby is doing that, it's just a matter of time that baby will eventually work. So, but if by the time the baby is 18 months and that child is not working, at, at that point is when now we worry as a as a pediatrician and I will expect you to, uh, at that point is when we will now want you to bring the child to us. Okay. All right. I hope that answered that uh, question. All right, um, somebody else is asking, I'll try and see if I can bring uh, Rusala in. A face, uh, Eunice is asking, is biting part of development in a one year old? Okay, is biting, Rusala, can you hear me? Can you see me? Okay, I'm not so sure she is. Okay, is biting part of development in a one year old? Now, that's a very, it's a tricky question. Okay, so normally when babies are drinking out their teeth, they tend to have some kind of discomforts, you know, they, which make them feel like biting something. So it's not unusual for babies to bite on things, and sometimes they can bite on people as well <laughs> when they are trying to, uh, to get out the teeth. But usually it should stop. So, but then are we worried if a child is biting you know, in biting things that are not food materials or to human being, and is doing it. Maybe, for example, people who already have all their teeth and they are doing it like not because they're in discomfort, but they are doing it, you know, because they they don't really know how to, uh, they don't see it as something wrong to do. So it is, it is not like it's a normal development, but it can happen, especially during the process when babies are bringing out their teeth. But then watch out again because sometimes it could also be a manifestation of some other uh, developmental condition. But I hope I'm not confusing you anyway. But don't worry about a one year old who is biting because most of the time is because of the they are bringing out the teeth and there's really nothing to worry. About. Okay. So, Busala, can you are you with us now? Yes, I'm here, ma. Can you just help us with the next question? 
There's a question from Olamide Oluwatuyi. What's yeah. the best line of approach for a 15 month old child that is exposed to chicken pox from a household contact? Okay, thank you. Uh, so we get a lot of these kind of questions about uh, household contacts and chicken pox. If I, one of our volunteers was asking me, she herself had the chicken pox and she had a baby, a very maybe two, three month old baby with her and she was so worried. Uh, what can she do? Now, let's start by saying that um, the best protection against chicken pox is immunization. So there's chicken pox immunization. And so we encourage that children should get chicken pox immunization. But most time you can't get it until one, two years. So it is not unusual that you, you have a child who is not yet for the age of immunization and the child now gets exposed to chicken pox. Now, the next solution is actually to give the child what we call a temporary protective um, immunization, what we call passive immunization against chicken pox. So we have what we call immunoglobulins, so, which can also be sold, but they are terribly expensive and they are very difficult to get, it's really in, in our own country, they are very, very difficult to get in Nigeria. So most of the time there's really nothing you can do about it. So what we just do, if you can't get immunoglobulin to give passive immunization to the baby, then the next thing you can do is just to watch and wait and just try and limit the contact. In other words, you don't just keep exposing the baby. So basic rule of hygiene, like washing of your hands often, try to limit you know contact with the baby with the person who has chicken pox if it's another sibling try and see that the others are not you know playing together all the time you know they and not that they were isolated the person but at least they should limit the amount of exposure they should wash their hands often and things like that it will help but sometimes you just have to wash and wait and if the other people because sometimes other they they're just going to have it and if they have it you just, since you already know that you are expecting and you just be aggressive with the uh, the treatment. The, luckily, chicken pox is a viral infection. Most of the time, it doesn't require any specific uh, drug management. So sometimes we can use some antiviral agents, like what we call like cyclovir and the rice. But most time, it should just run its course and stop. So the most important thing is to watch as it doesn't have complications. So you need to give lots of fluids. You give you rub the skin with calamine lotion to give soothing effects, to, and you can give something for the itching and all that. But and but most time you just wait for it to run its course, and that's it. So sometimes there's really nothing you can do. Unfortunately, when it has happened, it has happened. You just have to deal with it. Uh, so allow me to allow so you just watch. It's it's not compulsory that a child will have it. And let me quickly answer the question about if it's a mother that has it because you can't leave your baby. Uh, luckily, uh, as a mother, if you have had chicken pox before, you've been immunized before, you should be able to produce those antibodies that will protect a newborn baby or in, uh, against chicken pox. But sometimes there's really nothing you can do about it. You just watch and wait. The best thing to get that immunoglobulin was, I don't think I've even ever had use it because it's so rare and it's so expensive to get. All right. So I hope we've been able to help you a lot today. Yeah. We move on to the next question. Okay. Yeah. Amarachi also is asking, good morning, Ma. Is what is autism? Can a child outgrow it? Can a child talk fluently, interact, and communicate? Please put me through. And what's the cost? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amarachi, for your question. And just to say that autism is like a whole topic on its own. We can spend the whole of this uh ACP Live just talking about autism, but what I'm going to do, there's going to be autism day in April, usually April 2nd or thereabouts is autism, uh, we celebrate autism, World Autism Day, I will come back and talk about autism, but I'll just give you a, a little uh, information about autism. So autism is a developmental condition, we actually call it autism spectrum disorders, where children have difficulty with the, what we call social communication, social you know interactions and sometimes they have what we call some repetitive or restricted pattern of behavior so if a child has this uh two major things social communication difficulties and presence of repetitive restricted pattern of behavior we say that child is on the autism spectrum and it's also a spectrum so when we say something is a spectrum it means it varies. So you have the mild hand, just like the way I talked about cerebral palsy before. So you have the mild one. So you have children who have autism or you have adults with autism 
who can talk, who can go to school, who can do everything, everything. And there are professors, there are international celebrities who have autism. At the end of the day, you also have the other hand of autism where children are non-verbal. In other words, they have no words. And then they, they have a lot of uh, difficulties. They need to go to a special school and all that. So it depends on where the child is on the spectrum. But what we normally recommend is that the best thing for the child to be diagnosed early. Uh, so if you suspect that the child has autism, you see a pediatrician, preferably a developmental pediatrician and or a speech therapist. And then the child should be assessed and then the child should be provided with the right support. So with, with, with the right support, most children with autism can overcome their difficulties. In other words, so if a child with autism is not talking, the child can, with speech therapy, begin to talk. The child can learn the social skills. It's just that what you take for granted in the other children, you don't, most of you don't teach your children to talk. They just start talking. And most of the time, you don't teach them to greet people or to have friends. They just do it spontaneously or to play with other children. But children will also seem need support around these difficulties. But with support, they can overcome the uh, challenges. So, um, and there are a lot of supports online. There are a lot of uh, supports online. There are a lot of uh, support groups for parents. So you can just go online and search. And if you are in a particular part, uh, like I know, for example, I'm not trying to advertise for a guaranteed trust bank, but I know they do a lot of autism uh, advocacy. They do a lot of conferences. Sometimes they do a lot of free assessments for children. I think they do it around July. So those are things that you can, you know, uh, tap into even in Nigeria to. Uh, but but there is up or oh, you just any of our teaching hospitals most of them will have uh, facilities for doing assessment but with help and with the right uh, support most of them can overcome but uh, what we normally recommend is early diagnosis so the earlier you see the specialist uh the better and let me just send the warning there because most of the time in nigeria when a child is slow in development a child is two year old is not talking people oh it's just a boy oh boys always talk less. I, I, I once wrote a, a, a particular article where I actually tell the story, you know, so a child is not talking at so everybody will tell you, oh, no, it's not a problem, uh, no, but it's a fact. Uh, my son didn't talk on the three years old, yeah, my son didn't talk on the four years So they kind of reassure the parents, and sometimes uh, uh, the parents don't come to seek help on time because we, the neighbors, we, the friends, and this is one of the reasons why we have asked the pediatrician because we don't want you to ask mother sometimes because sometimes they can... They meant well, but sometimes, you know, you can be sincerely wrong, even though you meant well. And so I always say it's better to err on the side of caution. It's better to get the child assessed and be reassured by a pediatrician to say, oh, there's nothing wrong. You are just being worried. I know that sometimes I tell mom, so you are first time mothers, you always come and disturb the pediatrician. But I don't mind you disturbing me. You know, it's better for you to disturb me. And I tell you, okay, don't worry. You shouldn't have bother coming down for me to discover, than for me to say, why they need to come on time? Why are you just coming now? You know, so it's better for us to make sure that we take the child for so it, and mothers are very good. We have this intuition. I, I and I always say mothers always trust your intuition. You it's I think it's like it's like a God given radar, you know. Sometimes mother just see it like oh, there's something not right here, and then they just you know, but sometimes they ask the wrong people and then they tell them, Oh, don't worry, you're just being worried, and that is a problem. So if you as a mother, you have intuition, there's something not sounding, sitting well with this child, please see a pediatrician. See, let them have your child assessed first. Let them be the, let the professional be the one to reassure you, and then you can now uh, rest. So I hope that helps. Yeah, for sure. Though. Yeah. Let's move on, my brother. Oh, I can't see any other question here. Yet. Oh, you can see the question. So, Alani is asking, uh, my baby is almost six months and it's not already seen any other maybe beyond beside breast milk. I'm almost through with exclusive breastfeeding for him and I'm weary to try any other meat. Please, when can I start my, my when can I start with baby food or local made soy meat? Now, uh, Alani thank you so much for your question. Number one, even from your question alone, I think. You are doing it wrong. That's the issue. You see, we need to understand the number one. Your baby is just six months old. So your baby should just 
still be finishing breastfeeding. And yet you started so many mix already. That means you were not actually doing exclusive breastfeeding because you couldn't have tried all the make. And your baby is just a very good baby who is listening to the pediatricians and telling you, the pediatricians say I should only take breast milk for six months. So I'm not going to take any other milk. Good boy or good girl. I don't know which one he is. So please leave the baby alone. The baby is doing well. No breast, no other milk until six months. Fine, your baby is correct. So after six months, you now start introducing other food. And so if you are a member of ATP, if you go to our group, if there's anything we really talk about a lot, I think we talk about nutrition a lot on ATP. So we have a unit course on complementary feeding, on how to go about complementary feeding. So your baby doesn't need any other milk. What your baby needs is to start eating other food. And there's a process to that. So from six months, you start introducing new food to your baby. And there's a process to that. And usually when you start, you don't start like, you start a baby who just finished breastfeeding for six months. You're not going to give them 200 minutes of pap before the very first say no. So you, you, you start complementary feeding gradually. You start replacing one, you start adding one or two meals, then before you know you grew up, and then you start with something light, semi-solid consistency. It doesn't have to be milk. It doesn't have to be a thin product. It, that's the mistake we also make as mothers. We think that when we talk about when we finish breastfeeding, then we need to go to another thin product, either a milk or a cereal or whatever. No, you can give your baby complementary feeds from your own kitchen. And remember, you are still going to keep on breastfeeding. So you're not stopping breastfeeding, and you're only just going to start adding things. And you can add local food. I'm happy you make mention of that. So you don't need to try any other milk. Complementary feeding is not going from breast milk to another milk. It is going from continuing breastfeeding while you are adding other products and I mean other food. And it can be food that you eat as well. So it could start with something like cereal, it could be a fruit, you know, like a porridge, and you give the child. So we have very lovely videos, very simple. How do I start? How often do I do it? How what what can I use? Very lovely videos. So I would recommend you go to ACP, go to our unit section. You will see the there's a unit on breastfeeding, which I'm sure you have done, and then there's yeah, and there's a unit on breastfeeding, and then there's a unit on uh, complementary feeding. So you 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 can't watch those videos and not understand complementary feeding, and then you realize that you are you don't need to worry at all. So uh, Lanika, you have to go and do it properly. Okay, I hope that helps. Let's move on to the next uh, question. Yeah. yeah. The next question is from Mama Paris. Hmm. She's asking. Is there a remedy for colic pain? My baby is one month and I'm really concerned. It's sad yeah. seeing him go through this. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. I know it can be very. It's can mom, mom don't like the babies being in pain and they. No, but well, let's start by saying that we don't think babies are having pain when they're having colic. I know they cry and people say, oh, babies maybe I think it's because of the crying. Mothers always think it's pain and then they think, oh. Um, I, I've seen mothers cry when the babies are crying as well because of colic, and it's so amazing. I mean, that shows the love of a mother. Now, so colic is one of those things that will come to pass. You know, I always say mothers, eh, don't worry. It's, there are some things that will just come to pass, you know, and, and, and I always let mothers know that sometimes we as pediatricians, we don't always do something about everything. Sometimes we just sit and watch and let and let the thing come to pass so colic is one of those things and what really happens in colic is the is the discomfort it's not like a pain like abdominal pain babies are just getting aware of their bodies and it is um, when gas or things are flowing through their body it kind of surprises them and sometimes they you know they get discomfort and they, they have that discomfort so there are ways of reducing it and one of the ways of reducing it is by making sure that uh, we, we uh, breastfeeding actually protects also because uh, babies who are on bottle feeding and milk, uh, they tend to have lots more gases. And it is those gas moving and difficulty with, you know, sometimes the gas is kind of discomfort the babies and when they pass it, they feel somehow. And that's why you see sometimes when they, when they pass the gas, they feel relieved and then they stop the crying. 
So we always recommend breastfeeding, no bottle feeding and all that. And even for the breastfeeding, make sure your baby don't cry too long before you breastfeed. Because when they cry, they actually mm -hmm. suck in a lot of hair before you put them to breast. And that was so me. And they have to pass out all those guys, all those hair, all those guys that they've sucked in. So those are little, little things that you can even use to prevent a little bit of colic. Now, when colic itself, but sometimes it's, it's just one of those things that will happen. There's nothing you can do about it. There are non-medication way, just comforting the baby, just rolling them, you know, uh, like the grannies, they know how to do it. It's, you know, my Yoruba grandma will say one pass, it, one pass, it, four more, you know, like you just take the baby and just rock them a little bit, put them on your back, so it helps. Sometimes we can recommend medication like Infacol. Infacol, we recommend Infacol. It helps, for, you know, it helps some babies. Sometimes it doesn't happen. It doesn't help. So the babies will go through it. But the good news is that most babies will stop having colic by three months. So if you try, if you try all those med, um, rocking method, making sure you're not using bottles, so making sure you are, you are not allowing the baby to take in a lot of hair, you can also try Infacol. Those are the things you can try. If with all that, your baby is still having it, just hang in there. It will stop max three months, then your baby will be fine. Okay, so I'm not kind of worry it will come to pass, huh? but you can try in fact call and it will help. We don't recommend there are some other products I don't we don't recommend, but I don't want to mention it so that the people who make them will not come for me. <laughs> but we don't recommend things like uh I can see I can mention some names. So mothers give things like Bonabe, people give things like Colipan, people give things like um uh what other one they give uh there's so many of them that give but we don't recommend all those the only thing we recommend for your colleague is infacol and or if there's no infacol just rock the baby use non non uh, medical method medication method and the baby will be fine and we but whatever it is just hanging there by the time your baby is three months everything will be over all right okay let's move on <coughs> okay isn't it that one what can be the cause of a 14 month baby that started talking like calling names of the elder ones but stopped talking after she fell sick that lasted for three weeks not even the names she used to call before now okay that's a that's a very serious one um not to frighten you but i i am worried about that child then as a developmental pediatrician anytime a child regrets in other words Anytime a child stops doing what they are doing before in development, it's a concern. It's a big flag. It's a red flag for any developmental pediatrician. So I worry. And I'm particularly worried because you said this child was sick for three weeks. So what, what kind of sickness? I, like, I, imagine, I can imagine a kind of sickness that will make a child to be ill for three weeks. So it's no meningitis or something like that. But those kind of conditions that make a child to be very sick, can even cerebral malaria and all those things, they can cause the child to regress. And it's a, we need to monitor that child. Sometimes some children just regress and then they begin to pick up again and we are happy. But sometimes it's a sign for us that there's something going wrong with the development. And so I would recommend that you see a developmental pediatrician or a pediatric neurologist or any pediatrician that is in your close to you where you where, because you maybe need to be monitored you will also see that sign in children with autism because sometimes one of the red flags of autism is the fact that the children stop doing what they are doing before so the child is already talking calling names and then they stop so i'm gonna make a diagnosis on your baby or what i'm just trying to say is that your child is having a, 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 a I mean, this child is having symptoms that is a red flag for me as a developmental pediatrician, and I really need to get some. You need to get somebody to monitor that child's development, and depending on what what illness was wrong with the child for three weeks, that's also a big flag. If you can give us a little more information, that will also help me to really tie it together. But whatever the case, that child really needs to be monitored and to be seen by a pediatrician it's a very important thing that you do that okay we'll move on lawa lion kai is asking good morning ma my baby mm. is five months plus exclusive exclusively best friend but his weight is not on the average some weeks ago his school was green it's okay now i'm coughing and it seems he has contacted it too what do i use is a hyperactive baby he does virtually <laughs> all the things his mates cannot do 
Uh, la wow, why do you give our baby cough? We need to come and sue you. We need to come and uh, eh, we need to come and carry you in your house. Why should you give our baby cough? Eh? Anyway, that's just by by the wayside. So, um, number one, to answer the question about the weight, you need to give me more information because I don't know what your own average is. So, uh, you know, mothers, I don't know whether you are using the average because of your other friends' uh, baby's weight is your own average. So, you need to really be specific with me. So, for your baby, I need to know what was the best weight and what is the current weight, then I will know whether it is average or not average. So you need to give me more information. But I could imagine that a baby who was having greenish too was not getting enough breast milk. So try and make sure you breastfeed more often, more frequently. I'm happy it has stopped, but try and breastfeed on demand was what we recommend. And relax. One of the reasons why mothers have difficulty with breastfeeding or uh, or they don't breastfeed adequately is because of worry or stress, anxiety. Because when you have all that, it it, it makes your breast milk not. The breast milk is produced from the brain. Uh, I hope you know that your breast milk is actually produced from your brain, not from the breast. In other words, there's an hormone from the brain that tells the body to produce more. We need more milk. We need more milk. And that breast, that hormone comes in when you, when your baby is sucking, when you are seeing your baby, you are happy, hearing the voice of your baby, and you are relaxed. That hormone will work, and breast milk will be produced a lot. But if you are stressed and you are anxious and worry, you are so, then the, the the brain tells the body, no, we don't want breast milk now. We need to sort out this stressful condition first. You know, your life, you know, let's sort out this mother first before we can think about producing me for the baby. And that's what normally happens. So you see me most of the time tell the mothers, relax, relax, relax. That's the solution to producing more breast milk. Relax. If you need to stop working, if you need to take a break, if you need to take leave, that is why some of us have, you know, in some countries, maternity leave is one year because we don't want you to be stressed about anything. In fact, Lagos State has now made it six months because you really need to relax to, to be able to do that exclusive breastfeeding. Most other companies are companies that maternity leave is six months because they want you to be able to do your breastfeeding for six months. So relax, don't worry about running up and down, making all the money in Nigeria. Please relax so that your baby can breastfeed. So, and um, that's what you need to do. I don't know. I'm happy your baby is active, and maybe your baby is doing everything. That's good. But for me to be able to answer your question specifically, I, I really need to know what is the weight of your baby now, and what was the what was the best way then I can answer that question. All right, but just relax. You, your baby will be fine. Okay. We move on. Okay. Good morning, ma. Please, ma. What does sitting have to do with the baby's stooling? And what can be taken to prevent it or to control stooling? Ah, thank you, Ogundei, uh, Kemi. So, stooling has nothing to do with sitting. That, that just even ended there. That's the answer to that one. Sitting and stooling, nothing. So, we've talked about sitting. I think we did an open house on, I mean, we did the ATP live on sitting because it's one of those things mothers worry about. So, sitting and stooling, no. So, it is a mindset or it's a myth that mothers have that babies must have watery stool when they are sitting, pure meat. So I've seen babies, I've had my own babies, and throughout the process of sitting, no diarrhea is possible. And you don't need to give anything to prevent it. You don't need to give anything to, uh, you don't need to give anything to prevent it. You don't need to give anything to stop to. Sitting is a normal physiological process. I'm looking for those my ATP slides that talks about uh, sitting and all that. I'll, if I find it later, I will show you. So sitting is a normal physiological process. So it, it is it is just as simple as your baby uh, uh, your baby having um, a growing walking, running, speaking. It's just the same thing. That's exactly what sitting is. It's just the same process. So it has nothing to do with, it's not a sickness. It's not an illness. I'm, I'm trying to look for, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for some of those pictures so that I can show us. You know, it is not a sickness. It's not anything. So sitting is just a normal physiological process. And you don't really need to worry about it at all. So that is um, that is number one for us to know. And then um, 
so you don't need to do anything and i hope you know that you don't need to go and give uh, uh what what we give now you don't need to give any teaching mixture we don't recommend that at all so just leave the baby alone and what i've explained to nigerian mothers why sometimes our babies tend to have those in, uh, infections during the, the period they are sitting. During the time babies are sitting, they tend to bite on so many things a lot because they have that sensation, that feeling to bite on something. So you see them putting lots of things in their mouth. Remember, it's also about the same time, six months that they begin to sit. It's about the same time they begin to touch everything. They move their hands. So they are more they are more adventurous, which is quite good. But you as a mother now need to make sure that the environment is always clean. Also, this is about the time most mothers stop breastfeeding. This is also about the time most mothers start giving other food. And sometimes we worry, you know, breast milk, God prepared it, hygienic, perfect, you no, know, everything is perfect, right temperature, right uh, straight from the source, it's, not, it's produced as needed, and all that. So, more babies are fine. But now you start cooking your own food. Some mothers know hand washing, they are preparing food. Some people will prepare milk from morning, then they'll be giving it at night. Why would the baby not still? You know, so those are the things. So, it is our own practices around that period that makes this baby to have this thing. It is not the teaching itself. So, all the toys, you make sure it's, it's, it's uh, you sterilize them. Most of them, the toys will just drop on the floor and the mother will just move it, clean it on their own clothes, clean it on their own clothes, and, give it back to the baby. and the baby put it back in their mouth. Jams, I mean, that's those are the things that is causing the diarrhea. It is not the teaching. So, but if you, you just try it, sterilize, make sure your house, you clean it, disinfectants all over the place, sterilizing your toys. It's not only bottles that are sterilized. You sterilize toys as well, because these toys, the baby's supposed to in their mouth, at least wash it once a day. Those are the things that we need to do. When you do all those things, your baby will be healthy. So it has nothing to do with teaching, but you need to make sure that this period, the baby's been exposed to lots of germs. But you as a mother, you need to reduce this. And when you are introducing complementary feeding, please do it right. All this one will prepare milk and will prepare food. Then you will say, okay, you didn't finish that one. Go and keep it. You will go and bring that same food to give the baby. No, I always say, when the baby doesn't finish it, throw it away. You don't keep it. Because when you keep it, the bacteria inside have multiplied. So those are the things that make our baby to have diarrhea. It, it, some people will prepare their pap inside one gallon like that. And they will carry it up and down for all. <laughs> from morning to night, that's what the baby is going to eat. Those are the things that is making our babies to have diarrhea. When baby doesn't finish a milk in a the bottle, they will keep it. They want it to stay. Go and warm it. You are warming bacteria. So those are the things causing the diarrhea. It has nothing. It's just a, like a coincidence if you like it. But if you make effort and make sure that you maintain good hygiene, good proper nutrition, good. You make sure whatever your baby is putting in their mouth. If you need to use a tita, make sure you have your tita and you sterilize your tita every morning. When it drops, go and put it back in the sterilizing solution before you give it back. They don't just it on your clothes. Those are the ways by which you introduce jams to our babies. So I hope that will help. So teaching and diarrhea, nothing to do with them. Okay. Okay, we're moving on. So I think I talk a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a question from Tony. Good morning, Mama. Is there any cause to worry if a boy of six years starts growing pubic hair? No, not to worry. It's just what we call early, early pubic hair, you know. Some, you know, just like when I was talking about development, some things we all do it at the average, you know. And one thing the people like Dr. Woman, the endocrinologist will tell us that their age, where people begin to mature, is actually going lower and lower every day. So in our olden days, it's higher, but now even eight, nine, children are already having puberty, you know. So it is not unusual. So we we'll just monitor, but sometimes in some children, it could be a sign of um, some other illnesses. So if you worry about it, if that's the only thing, most of the time we just watch. We just say it's isolated, you know, early development, but we watch it. But if there are other signs in that baby to make us worry, then I think you will need to see a, um, a pediatric endocrinologist. But most time there's really nothing wrong, just being healthy. But sometimes it could happen in some condition, rare condition like cancer, some condition, some drugs, and all that. But, so, but if there are other signs to make you worry, just so see a pediatric endocrinologist. Thank you. Can you see the next question? Good morning, yeah. Doc. Yeah, there's a question here. Good morning, Doctor. Please, Ma, when should this child start talking? My baby is one year and can only say papa. 
That's good. So I always tell, teach mothers by the rule of the thumb. So the rule of the thumb is that a one year old should be saying one word, single words. So usually by one year old, most children will have one to three words. So they have either mama, papa, or they call um, they call some names, hallelujah, amen, something they are used to. By two years, they should begin to combine two words together. You know, they should begin to combine two words together. By three years, they should begin to combine three words together. That is the rule of the term. And by four years, they should be speaking like an adult. So you should have a conversation with a four-year-old, and they should speak grammatically correct, everything is sound, you know. So that's what we aspire. So, and but remember, this is, I just give you average. So some children are what we call late bloomers. They may talk a little bit later than the other children and all that. But if the other areas of development are fine, we will not worry. So... Let me just say, most most speech therapists will not worry about your child not talking until the child is true. So, in other words, we always give gap for those who could be slower than the other people. So, some people, are, you see some one year old, they're already talking like full sentences, you're like, wow. But also, some babies may not talk until two, but there's nothing wrong with them. So, most of the time, we just give gap for those who are fast and those who are slow, everybody will catch up. So, but by the time they start getting to two and there are no words, or there are just a few words will start, that's when people like us and the speech therapists will start getting uh, concerned and that's when you do. But what, if you what I would recommend for you, if you go on ATP, on our Activision Facebook group, we have a, a lot of articles or a lot of posts on how to encourage speech development in your child. Now, children don't learn talking by watching TV or by playing video games. Children learn talking by talking to people. You talk to them and you let them talk back to you. But these days, most time parents, they don't see us from morning to night, eh? the average working mother. So, but we really need to play with our children. So children start learning to talk, not by talking, but by playing. You know, that is how, because uh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to go into that. Maybe I'll bring the speech habit to that. But see, children uh, talking uh, is, is, is a, is a, it's like a uh, an imaginative thing, you know. So when I say dog, you don't see G O G. What you see is a a dog. You think of a dog. That's what you think about. That's how we. That's how we know language. So when so children need to learn to play what we call symbolic play, pretend play. It is a precursor to them knowing that okay, when I see the word, I can now use the word G O G to represent this animal. So initially they start by playing, they feed their jaw, they put the dog to their back. All those play they used to do, they are very important. They are what precede them knowing that, okay, when I now see, when I say this thing, this particular, uh, 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 this particular uh, vocabulary or whatever, it means something else. So it is, it is very important. So we have a lot of do-it-yourself parent strategies on how to improve speech development. So if you're worried, just start doing it. You can do it for all children that you lose nothing even if there's nothing wrong with your child just do it anyway and your child's speech will but if by two years and your child is not yet talking that's when i will recommend you see a pediatrician okay our time is going now we still have lots of questions yeah i was just going to say that now we need to rush up we there's a question from pony helen how does it why does a toddler keep having tonsillitis often at least once in three months Oh, okay. I think I'm you. I'm this. I display another question. I was I really the same thing. Okay, I don't know why you. Okay, but I can answer the one you you said first. A tons, a child is having tonsillitis. Is okay, don't worry, don't worry. So if a child is having tonsillitis every six months, that is too frequent. So I would recommend you see your pediatrician. Sometimes they have what we call like another hypertrophy, and what that means is that we need to take it out. And um, but they, usually we want to watch your ways. But if it's if the infection is so often, the solution is to take out the tonsils. That's what they will do finally. But if they can watch and see, you know, try other ways, and we can wait because usually sometimes it will go by itself. The tonsil will shrink on its own. But if it's really causing infection, you are in and out of hospital several times in a year, then they will need to take it out. So the question actually was displaying is uh, everybody from my is asking about dry scaly. Can you say that now? Uh, dry scaly. Part after the tonsillitis. 
I don't know. Anyway, I'm displaying this one now. That uh, my son has a dry scaly patch on top of his skin, and his face color is dark and fair. Okay, yeah, look like he's three months old. Okay, look like a child with uh, atopic dermatitis or maybe with some complicated um, fungal infection or whatever. Uh, so, if I'm not, you really need to take your baby to see your doctor because. We, before we can make a diagnosis of a rash, I really need to say it. So I, I hope you understand that because I keep explaining why we, the way why doctors do say certain way. So it is not enough for you to tell me. From what you've told me, I have an idea. It could be atopic dermatitis, but because there's also that scaly and whatever, we may need to be sure there's no additional complication like a fungal thing. So the, the commonest cause of this thing is when babies react to the products you are using. So I always tell mothers, uh, baby skins are so sensitive, so be careful. They All these nice smelling products that we buy eh, for babies, they're nice. They make your house smell nice. They make babies smell nice but they are not good for the baby's skin because most of those things that smell nice are chemicals. They are chemicals in those products and those chemicals, the babies react to them. So we always say go for what we call hypoallergenic product. It's always written on it. So the rights tested by the pediatrician or dermatologist and it's okay. Those products have less chemicals that can make your baby react. So you may want to try that first and then you can see, see your doctor for further uh support okay i think we are moving now i think i um yeah, Mel 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 Mel. yeah okay yeah can a four-year-old child outgrow adenoid hypertrophy i have been managing it from birth yes you, they can i i think you really need to go uh melda you need to go to our facebook group i think last or two weeks ago we have a consultant tnt surgeon who was with us and he um it it dealt it dealt with that topic and i was so happy it was very simple very straightforward so what the ent doctors do is to watch and see usually by we usually will wait until five six years i know you've been managing it from birth you're almost there <laughs> so if your baby is not having infections and all that and your baby is not having signs of obstruction or difficulty with breathing at night or what we call sleep apnea and all that your baby is not having any of those complications maybe it's just the snoring you can just watch and wait a little more till your baby is like a five six usually by five six if they still worry then the the ent doctors will take it out but if your baby is having others in, in symptoms like right um is having infections and all that then you will need to uh see but whichever we see your ent surgeons and then they will take it up from there okay i think i'm rushing now from endurance my baby had jaundice for six weeks but mm. it is now clearing a bit from my eye for for these seven weeks uh, and on ex exclusive breastfeeding hope it will not affect the baby and before she before she pulls she always twists her body and it looks as if the pool is hard for her to pull. But the, when the, when she pulls it out, it's normal. Wow. Yeah, so that's a perfect description of a child just having discomfort or colic. Like I was telling the other mom when I answered the question about colic, if they maybe not, they are not having pain. There's nothing wrong with the stool. They are just, it's just that process. They are very aware of their body. You know, their body is so small and tiny. So any little movement kind of shocks them or surprises them. So they feel as if it's a major incident about to happen, but there's really nothing because the stool is actually normal. So, but as they get bigger and more mature, then they begin to as uh, well that. But uh, endurance, I'm worried about your baby having done this for six weeks. That's pretty long. That's pretty long. That's pretty long. What was the cause of the jaundice? Did your pediatrician tell you the cause of the jaundice? Because for me to see the jaundice is not the problem. It's like jaundice will always clear. Whether it lasts for one week, six weeks, seven weeks, it will eventually clear. But I'm worried about what the jaundice has caused before it left. So what, what, why do you maybe have jaundice for six weeks? That's a prolonged jaundice. But any jaundice lasting more than two weeks is prolonged jaundice. So you really need to ask your pediatrician what is the cause of the jaundice and whether it's something you still need to worry about or not. But I just hope your baby is fine, you know, in terms of the brain development. So that's what I worry about as a developmental pediatrician. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah, let's read the next question. From Chinelo. Hmm. Uh, from Chinelo. She says, 
where one has twins or triplets and it's difficult for the mother to do exclusive breastfeeding the babies are three months and refuse thin milk what do you advise okay so number one it is possible to do exclusive breastfeeding for twins it is possible i know triplets will be stretching it <laughs> But it's possible to. I've seen people do for twins easily. I've seen a lot of twins who are exclusive breastfed, so that one is not an issue. Maybe triplets may be hard, and then um, no. So they are reducing team milk. Uh, what do you advise? I don't know what to advise. You have to try different milk until you get what they like. In other countries, we used to do what we call surrogate uh, uh, wet nursing, where somebody else you can get breast milk from breast milk bank, and you can use another mother's milk. Some people are very blessed; they lactate a lot, and they can just bottle the milk. But since the advent of HIV is, we are very very careful because uh, people can get uh, babies can get HIV from breast milk. So even though you may be sure, you know, but this is somebody just wants to avoid, you know, so that you avoid stories that tell <laughs> that touch later. So we don't we don't encourage much wet nursing anymore. So there are thousands of baby milk. So you may need to just work with your pediatrician, and your pediatrician can figure out. Yeah, and you know, usually it's, well, I always wonder when mommy say my baby refuse, my baby refuse. It is not easy to try something new. I and I always ask them when you go to another country and they offer you new food. Do you? It's not every time you go. To, and at least I, I can talk for myself. I don't always jump into new food so easily like that. I know some people are very adventurous, but majority of us will like. What is that? Do we, you know what is that? Who are you? So it is not unusual for so babies are also just being normal human beings. So it is not unusual for them not to like something new immediately. So you really need to persevere. You need to be persistent when you're trying to introduce them. Because when your baby needs to eat, sha baby must eat. So try. There are two ways you can also increase. Try and increase your own breast milk production. Actually, you can lactate. You you just like a lot of stress. So you may still need somebody to help you to feed them. But if you keep lactating and storing, keep lactating and storing, you can actually breastfeed your babies. But you may actually do all the all the work is just expressing breast milk. Why somebody will have to be feeding the three three of them? So, but you can try. But you can also work with your pediatrician, and then they will see how to help you. Actually, baby milk should be prescribed by pediatrician. People don't know that you because you should actually take breast milk. And if your baby needs to use baby formula a pediatrician should prescribe it for you because we need to know certain things we need to know about allergies we need to know about all those things so but i know in nigeria uh, in most places people just go and buy the milk by themselves according to what they like according to their pocket but really it, ideally we pediatrician should prescribe formula for you to use yes because we only will prescribe it only if we have exhausted the opportunity that like that okay your baby is not able to take breast milk. We've tried every other option, and then without, so it to be prescribed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Time is going. How oh, our time has gone? Okay. Should Thank I just talk to them? them. Yeah. Aspen. Good Let morning, ma'am. My baby is four years. He's not walk. He's not talking. He can't say any word. He was sick when he was less than one year old and lost hold of his neck. Mm -hmm. But he got back mm -hmm. after treatment. All right, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's so well. So I guess your baby had, you know, that was what I was telling the other mom that also had similar question. So when baby regressed, that's what we call regression. And obviously, the babies begin to catch up with the neck control and all that. I think your baby must have had one of those uh, illnesses that affect the brain and like John, like um, meningitis, cerebral malaria. And unfortunately, those things can have a long long complications so a four-year-old should be talking like an adult should be talking like an adult so can we see a speech therapist um and a pediatrician to support your baby um i, I think it was a result of that illness maybe had at one year it, it's not unusual for us to have that kind of scenario i'm so sorry but you need to but the baby can be supported so get the right professionals and maybe will get the right support Okay, um, there's a question here on pubic hair, but we've answered it. We've answered pubic hair. So, so, let's, let's just leave it. so don't worry about it. Yes. Don't worry, that's all. Um, yeah. Okay. Is my an autistic child who has a little who has a little speech repeating most of the things you say? Is it a good sign that she will develop more speech and communicate very well? Thank you. It's a sign. It's a it's a sign that the child can learn language. It's a sign. Is that what we call echolalia? That's what we call echolalia when the children just repeat your words after you, you know, verbatim like that. We call it echolalia. 
but the child needs speech therapy. So please see speech therapy. And yeah, the child can learn to communicate. Don't worry. If the child has the words. The child, there's nothing wrong with the vocal cords. There's nothing wrong with the with the child being able to use words. So the child can actually say words, but the child needs to learn how to use the word appropriately. So the child needs to know that when we say how are you, you reply with I am fine, not to say how are you again. No. So those are the things that the speech therapist will work on. All right. But just just persist, it's, you will get there. Okay, I think Lawai is just answering my question. Okay, so I'm going to provide more information. Yes, yeah, yes, more information. Best way it was 6.2. Yeah. 10 weeks, it was 15 weeks, it was 5 kg. I haven't weighed him recently. With um, the look, he hasn't had it too much. Okay, your, your, your look is not a scale. Uh, it's just the same way I say your hand is not a thermometer. So your look is not a skill. So you really need to take this baby because your baby is now six months. And the last time you weigh your baby was at three and a half months. That's a long time ago. You know, you really need to weigh babies monthly. I was still answering one, one mom yesterday on ATP. You need to weigh babies monthly. Even when you are not going for immunization, you must still take them for weighing. They must be weighed every month until they are one year then after that you can you know we can reduce the frequency but you must weigh your baby and especially when now you're even concerned about the weight so that that's enough reason for you to just show up in your clinic you can even go to the health center you don't have to be a big uh, your normal hospital you just say i want to weigh my baby let them weigh the baby because your baby is gaining weight well i'm not worried about your baby's weight or, uh, as at this this one you are showing is fine but because we don't know the current weights now and i can't rely on your eyes your eyes is not a weighing machine so you really need to go and weigh the baby but really uh, your baby by now to be weighing like 6.4 kilos so that's why i really need to know what the baby's weight is if your baby's weighing you go and do the weight if it's about six or seven just relax that's fine but if, if it's if it's still like five or just maybe 5.5 or something then i will worry about your baby and the, but then the solution is just make sure you feed your baby start the complimentary feeding i think your baby's now six months start the complimentary feeding and your baby will be fine okay all right i think i've okay I've, this is we will answer this one someone asking about a seven year old complaint ba ba uh, uh, no 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 uh Samuel, a seven year old who complained pain in that area in a private part i am worried i am at high alert just reading it alone i am at high alert so that's not the baby you start doing any kind of you need to take that baby to see a pediatrician. We have to be sure that child has not been abused. That's the most important thing to rule out. Babies, children don't usually complain of pain in that area. They may complain of pain when they want to wee wee, you know, which may suggest uh, infection. And when they have infection, they actually have discharges. And when they, they can have discharges, they can have um, um, uh, rashes around that area that will even help you. But even with that, even if a baby, a seven year old is having rashes, is having discharge in that area, and it's not because the baby is not be wearing nice pants or he's, uh, he's not cleaning up after himself properly, it can happen. But you see, as a pediatrician, we always like to rule out the worst case scenario first. I rather be sure because it will be a very bad thing if we mix it. If we mix a baby, a child who is being abused, it's a, it will be very bad if we mix it so i would rather want to see that child and examine that child and make sure that i rule out any possibility of abuse if i rule it out then i can now think of other infection and and then i will decide how to treat the infection so i please don't go and be using white pan cream how do you know it's a how do you how do you know it's a fungal infection i even it's a fungal infection white can is not what i would normally recommend in that area so see Again, no self-medication, please. I, I am very, very worried about this baby. So, Samuel, I really want you to take that baby to the hospital immediately after this, um, uh, whenever the election is over. Let the pediatrician examine that baby. And please, you can send me a message on uh, on inbox me or email me or at ask the pediatrician, ask at ask the pediatrician.com or ask the pediatrician at gmail.com. I really want to follow up on that girl. It's very, very important. It's very, very important because sometimes that's the only sign that that child is going to give to us that we need to save this child now. Look at the story of this girl. Uh, what's her name? The girl that died in uh, Benway. It's because all the, all the professionals in that child were missing the sign, they were missing it until the child died. It's very sad. So, we don't want to miss any sign. So, please get that child 
examine properly. Okay, time is gone. We need to go. Okay, Chico is asking about uh, a child with AIDS with bedwetting. Okay, so we need to, we have a whole group discussion on bedwetting. Usually by five years old, children should stop bedwetting. We give them that up to five years old. So you really need to uh, make sure, number one, you limit the water intake uh, towards the evening time. And then you also uh, give, um, you take the child to, to wee wee intermittently you have to go and wake the child up at night and all that you re use your words and all that if you have been trying all those strategies and your child keeps some bread wet same we need to be sure there's nothing wrong with the what we call urinary tract actually if the bed child also bed wet during the day you know they will be on themselves during the day you really need to see a, a pediatrician to make sure that everything is is fine so those are the things that you really need to to do right now Okay, I, I'm just going to rush through the last question. Uh, why does my son of one year, three months, poop immediately after eating the power blue tree bone, whatever? It is okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a natural reflex. Some babies, some people have it, they tend to poop after the um, uh, after they have just the meal. Uh, meal, so there's really nothing wrong with that. So you just need to stop it. Okay, so we'll move on. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, people always ask us questions at the end of the day. Maybe we should start taking your question before the uh, the program starts so that we can finish them on time. Um, I have some that look like ringworm on my nipple. Ringworm on your nipple? Okay. Please, will it affect my seven month old baby? Because I'm thinking of stopping. Uh, 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 blessing. <coughs> Number one, let's know whether it is ringworm or not. Don't serve medicates and you are no, breastfeeding. Like please, it. whether for yourself or for your baby, don't give anything. I would rather you get a doctor to look at your breast for you. Be sure it's ring because I I we don't really see ringworm on breasts, so very unusual. What we can see what we call thrush or uh, candidiasis is the commonest fungal infection that can happen around the breast area. And usually it's because your baby has the oral thrush and it's not giving it to you. So before you look at what is normal and turn it into ringworm and go and give drugs that are not necessary, I would rather you forget get a pediatrician to look at your uh, breast. Your own doctor can do it as well. And if they think there's, yeah, they will tell you what to do. But please don't... Enjoy your, enjoy your life. Yeah, don't self-medicate when you are breastfeeding. All right, so Gloria is asking, uh, uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, for joining us. Low hemoglobin, low hemoglobin, that is uh, uh, what we call anemia. So there are many causes of anemia. Have you done the genotype of your baby? That's the first thing. In a Nigerian mother who is a child, a Nigerian child who is having persistently low hemoglobin or who is always short of blood, the first thing to rule out is that the child is not a sickle cell and you make a child so you really need to go and do the genotype and let the doctors also do more tests we need to know why is the child having the low hemoglobin is it iron deficiency is it nutritional or from your you think you're always making sure your baby is eating every day and all that so it's, it's so i guess it's not nutritional so but why is it so we need to know first because for example if your child has sickle cell anemia there's no food that will make the hemoglobin to go up it's always going to be low. That is part of what they have as somebody who, is on, who have sickle cell anemia. So we need to know why. The first thing is why. Why is this child having low hemoglobin? Then we can address, we can provide solution. Okay. There are many people worried about speech. I'm, uh, 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 so let me just run through it so that we can round up. I want us to round up in another okay. five minutes now. Uh, Lamide is asking about uh, 18 months, who is not clear. She repeats what we say. I think your baby is developing well. 18 months old, that's what they do. They repeat words after people and she understands that is perfect. Just leave, give her time. I've already said it. We surely we will not worry until your baby is two years. So your baby is even doing much better than a child is just saying one word anyway so i'm not worried about your child so just wait uh cassie is asking ah my baby nachis is he shake his body and head when i tell him to stop that he stop it and starts money but we later do it again after like one hour I i'm worried about that that sounds unusual but it's a nine month old well i don't know maybe he's just enjoying it but the reason why i'm not worried is because 
you, you can stop it. If it is not something you can stop, then I will worry about it. But sometimes maybe we just realize it's something fun and it's just enjoying it at this stage. Just watch. If you maybe stop doing it in another one month or two, by the time you're about one year, yeah, that's fine. If your baby doesn't stop doing it, or the baby draws cannot stop it, or you think baby's not aware what he's doing, then that one you really need to because I'm actually worried that you're able to tell a nine month old to stop doing something and they stop because that's very unusual for a nine month old. So if your baby is stopping, fine, it's okay, but then you should uh you should you should monitor it for now and if it's not getting better then please see your pediatrician we're riding up in another few minutes uh okay i'll take the question that came up before time uh my five months old on ebf cry before urinating and so okay uh it's still cries i'm thinking of giving water so what are, what has water got to do with the crying i don't think it was I don't think the problem is the water. What do you think the water is going to do that? The water will make the urine easier to pass or what? I don't understand. So you are maybe crying before. Is there any wound around that area and all that? Those are the things that we would normally watch. And is your baby crying for the urine or for the poo? Or you know, I, I don't know which doctor you'd see because sometimes you really sometimes we really need to be more patient with the baby to really know what why made the baby cry. Or is it just an habit or the baby cry even for everything, you know? So it, I, I don't see the link between the water and the breasts and the urine crying before passing urine. It has no link whatsoever. So I think you don't need to worry about that. Just finish your exclusive breastfeeding in another two weeks. You can start complimentary feeding and your baby can say water. But I am actually wondering what is wrong with your baby. And I would really love to see your baby more and decide uh, what to do. Okay, so we're running up. We're running. How can we prevent jaundice? Oh, my. That's a long question. Um, can you try and read our article on neonatal jaundice on our website? There's more information because it's a long one, and we, we I just want us to round up now. Sorry about that. Or you can just ask, okay? So, what I'll say is that if you can't finish answering your question now, uh, you can just uh, go to because our time is up. Sorry, we have to go. Uh, what you can do is that you can go to our um, uh, Facebook group. And you can post your questions there. And we're always there 24 6. We don't work on Sunday. Uh, we're always there 24 6 and we will answer your questions. So I, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer. Let me see how many questions are left. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I don't know. We still have a lot of questions. No, I won't be able to answer them now. It's already, we're already like 70 minutes beyond our schedule. So I've answered the last person that came at 10 o'clock. So uh, all the other people that come after 10, you are asking questions after our normal time for this broadcast. So I was going to stop here now. But don't worry. What you can do for us, uh, for our, our moderators, for those who are asking questions on the watch party, please, you can help us answer the questions under the as reply. Uh, but you can all just go to the Active your Facebook group, drop your questions there, like a post on its own, and then some will answer them, we will answer them, because we have to run right now. So thank you so much, so much, so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, uh, Busola, what do you have to say? And now what? Okay. Thank you so much. We do hope you enjoyed yourself. Personally, it was an enlightening session for me. We look forward to seeing you same time next week on this platform. Until then, keep sharing the things you've learned to other mothers, to make them better mothers. Keep using those information and keep watching it if you like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to say that this program has been brought to you by Axe Pediatrician Foundation. Uh, we are very sorry we took extra time. In the last one minute, I just want to say that you can support us. Uh, you can see on our screen our uh, Axe Pediatrician Foundation. And currently, apart from what we do online, we also do community medical outreaches. So we also go offline to support communities where they don't have access to pediatricians and all that. So you can support us. You can advertise on this program. You can uh, advertise on our all our platform, websites, group, uh, page. And you can just bless us by <laughs> donating so that we can reach more children. And I just want to also announce that Act Pediatrician is taking part in the Global Giving Accelerator Program, which is an incredible opportunity for us 
to raise funds on a global platform. And so we're going to be going live from March 11. And we want all of you that are listening to this program, you can give back. I mean, appreciate the fact that you have been blessed on this program by supporting us to make sure that we reach the minimum of five thousand dollars in uh, in from forty donors. So, if you want to be part of that, you can send us a, a message. You can or you can uh, email us. You can post on our group. Or we also share the link with you so that we can remind you when it is time. It's going to be from March eleven to March twenty nine. So, we really appreciate all of you supporting us so once again thank you so much and now all of you can go and vote um <laughs> so that if you have not voted for the president you can go and vote now no don't say your votes don't fight just be a good uh nigerian and once again we'll see you next week uh, at 10 o'clock for another edition of atp live bye from here have a wonderful weekend bye, bye.